Let's assume a person has never heard of DNS, um, has never heard of the Prague School or any of these things. Can you, in a somewhat succinct but not terribly brief manner, explain to people how all of this um, school of rehabilitation coalesced around this idea of what we call DNS? So going back to the founding fathers of the Prague School and what these various um, sort of insights were that each of them had and, and how mm -hmm. that sort of came together. Okay, so um, DNS or dynamic neuromuscular stabilization kind of built on some pioneers of functional rehabilitation. Um, there's many uh, that have been part of the Prague School of Rehabilitation, but I think uh, talking about the influence on the development of dynamic neuromuscular stabilization by Professor Pavel Kolaj, who runs the, the rehabilitation department at Prague School um, uh, at this time. I think we need to go back um, post-World uh, War II, Cold War era, 1950s is where um, Prague School of Rehabilitation was, was really founded. And it was uh, founded as part of the medical faculty of Charles University in, in, um, in Prague in the Czech Republic, or formerly Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic. And being post-World uh, post War II, Cold War era, so they were in Eastern Europe behind the wall, um, that may have been a factor for their, uh, not reliance, but tendency towards the use of, of observation in both diagnostic diagnosis, um, both observation and palpation for diagnosis and treatment. Um, all three of these pioneers were neurologists. Um, and, and who, who were the three? So the three, um, Vladimir Yanda, uh, Carl Levitt and Balclav Voita. Um, Professor Yonda, um, he had a keen sense of observation um, and he formulated um, concepts and principles that tied into postural, habi postural habituation, um, specifically the tendency for specific musculature to tend towards tightness and other musculature to tend towards weakness. And he, he termed this uh, upper cross and lower cross syndrome. So for example, with the, an upper cross syndrome, meaning the neck and shoulder region, um, with demands of, of life and the, the tendency towards postural habituation, such as with sustained seated postures, um, there's a tendency towards uh, the, the muscles in the back of the neck, the occipital muscles, the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is the muscle that also attaches to the skull and down to the uh, sternoclavicular joint, the pec muscles, the upper traps, that musculature would tend towards a tightening or an overactivation. Other mus musculature in the upper extremity, the serratus, which attaches to the ribs and, and the back of the, the scapula, um, the deep neck flexors, the middle and lower traps would, would have a tendency to tend towards the, a weakness. And with that um, tendency f towards overutilization or hypertonicity and underutilization, um, inhibition, weakness, um, that would also, he also recognized that that would affect the um, quality of, of, of movement throughout the kinematic chain and subsequently would lead to overload in specific areas throughout that kinematic chain. So that was um, a big contribution on his part, um, his colleague. Where would those places of overload be? So if you, if you have this tightness in the muscles you've described, the weakness in the muscles you've described, what is the consequence of that? Where does that load get distributed? Right. So you, with that imbalance and that postural uh, tendency towards postural habituation, 
you would see a tendency to overload in the transitional areas throughout the spine and throughout the extremity. So um, I didn't go into the specifics for lower cross syndrome. Lower cross syndrome, you have a tendency for the flexor, hip flexor complex to be overactive, tightened. So the psoas, the ilius psoas, rectus femoris, um, the uh, uh, back extensor musculature will also tend towards tightness. And then the weakness or the inhibition will tend to be towards the lower abdominal region and the gluteal region. So looking at it globally, um, you would see a tendency to overload again throughout the extremity, um, throughout the extremities, so the, the hip joint, the knee joint, um, but also specifically dealing with the spine, the lumbar sacral region, thoracic lumbar region, and the cervical thoracic region, all the areas where you see the transition of, of the curvatures, uh, lordosis and kyphosis. And um, uh, with that um, tendency for overload, you will get repetitive stresses on the passive structures uh, within that kinematic chain. So uh, as a clinician, uh, we know that if you tend to image these areas, or if you image the spine, these are the areas that tend to have the most degenerative changes or the most disc uh, pathology. And those changes aren't, uh, aren't usually uh, traumatic. They're not acute. They're accumulated over time. So the, the observation of these postural patterns or postural syndromes, and then the recognition of the um, dysfunction uh, with, with movement efficiency that it caused led him to develop specific treatments, um, uh, both uh, exercise-wise and manual-wise to, to address those, those issues. Um, his colleague, Carl Levitt. No, but Yon, uh, Yonda also had suffered polio as a, as a, as a youngster, didn't he? Yeah. So he, he had the, suffered the residual effects, the post-polio type syndrome. And that was probably a, a motivation for his, his passion for rehabilitation, his, his passion for the observation of, of movement. Um, uh, his... His uh, colleague, Carl Levitt, also a neurologist, um, he shared that, that observation palpation, um, uh, not technique, but uh, tendency to utilize that for diagnosis and, and treatment. He, he specifically focused on joint dysfunction, soft tissue dysfunction, as it related to those, those upper and lower cross syndromes. So he developed specific mobilization techniques for both the, the joint and the soft tissues, um, addressing what they were seeing with those, those postural, uh, postural habituation and movement dysfunction. Um, the third kind of pioneer, also a neurologist, uh, but also a pediatric neurologist was Valklav Voita. And he, uh, his, his observations observing the ontogenesis or the, the development of motor function after birth during the first 12 months where the postural, uh, our postural foundations are established neurologically. Um, he developed a specific uh, test called postural reactions where he could uh, tell the, the quality or the health of the maturation of the central nervous system during that period of time. And by doing this, he could assess whether there was pathology um, or a healthy developing central nervous system. So he, he developed uh, seven specific postural uh, reaction tests, developed and modified some other ones, utilized uh, primitive reflexes and uh, just observation, observation of the infant during development to be able to recognize the biological age, meaning the, uh, 
the maturation of that central nervous system as compared to the chronological age. So for example, if you had a six month old infant that was moving and reacting like a six week old infant, that would be an indication that there was some central nervous system pathology. He, his focus was on uh, treatment of the cerebral palsy infant and, and patient. And he was able to utilize that observation, those, uh, uh, the observation of the postural reactions, the assessment of the primitive reflexes to um, recognize early on before it would manifest clinically so that interventions could be taken earlier on to take advantage of the neuroplasticity, the ability of the, the brain to form motor engrams um, uh, more efficiently and work around those central lesions that you see with cerebral palsy. So he, um, all three of these uh, kind of founding um, members or founders of Prague School of Rehabilitation were or Professor Collage, Collage's uh, colleagues, mentors, instructors. They shared patients, they discussed cases, and um, uh, Pavel Collage developed or evolved all that, that knowledge and experience into what we call dynamic neuromuscular stabilization today. Now, before um, Pavel came along, what was the, so, so fast forward, this started in the 50s, but fast forward to the 90s. Uh, so the Prague School is well established. You have these sort of founding fathers, so to speak. What were the applications of the Prague School at that time? How much of it was rehabilitation for kids with cerebral palsy or rehabilitation for people who were injured versus prehabilitation for athletes? Like what, how, what was the breadth of the applicability of the Prague School? Right, so uh, Prague School uh, was, it's a group of clinicians and um, probably more of the, the early 90s, the application was primarily rehabilitation uh, cerebral palsy, general population, um, uh, with, uh, Pavel, uh, Professor Kolosh, just to go in a little bit of his background. Um, you know, again, he, he's the head of Prague School of Rehabilitation. He's also head clinician, uh, for the Czech Olympic teams and Czech national sports teams, hockey, soccer, men's and women's tennis. He himself was a high level, uh, uh, Olympic level gymnast. So, um, he, uh, his, his work, he's a pediatric, uh, physiotherapist as well. Um, his work with those three pioneers, uh, his experience as an athlete, his experience treating cerebral palsy and, and infants, um, he took that or started to apply that base of knowledge to the athletic population. And the, the focus of, of and the, the thinking of these, these founders of Prague School and, and Prague School today is it's, uh, the, the influence of the central nervous system is huge and kind of king as far as the uh, facilitating the efficiency of transfer of load throughout that kinematic chain. So early on, the focus was more rehabilitation um, over multiple populations, but maybe late 90s, um, early 2000s, Pavel started to uh, apply those teachings to that athletic population. And um, there's... Meaning to an uninjured athletic population or to um, an injured athletic population? Probably at that time, more of an injured population. 
um, two kind of stand, standout athletes that he was able to work with and integrate his concepts and principles of dynamic stability were uh, Jean Zelezny, hopefully I say that right. He's a, he was a, a Olympic uh, javelin thrower, three-time gold medal winner, still holds the, the record for uh, uh, javelin. Uh, 98.48 meters, I believe. And um, the other one is Yamir Yager, who, uh, hockey player, Czech hockey player. Um, he, uh, he was able to uh, help and work with them, uh, help them rehabilitate from injuries, but then also integrate the concepts and principles of dynamic neuromuscular stabilization to one, uh, decrease the risk of re-injury, but two, also provide the potential for better performance. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.